Imagine waking up tomorrow to news about a brand new global threat that has emerged and you are going to be a part of the team that is going to design and develop these solutions to help the world get out of this danger. This is the reality that many scientists and researchers around the world experienced just over a year ago when the need for a vaccine to protect against the virus that causes COVID-19 became apparent. In that time, groundbreaking research in science has been accomplished through the efforts and collaborations of scientists and researchers and governments. And millions of people have already been vaccinated and millions more will be vaccinated in the coming months so that we can put an end to this pandemic. However, two of these vaccines and actually the first two which were approved for use in countries around the world are using this new technology this new material in the vaccines themselves this material is called mrna now because new things can introduce a lot of questions a lot of uncertainty let's talk today about mrna what it is and how it works in a vaccine. Hello, I'm the Geeky Goth, and today we're talking about mRNA. First, a little bit about me. I got my bachelor's degree in immunology and microbiology. Then I decided to hang around for a little bit more science, and I'm currently a graduate student pursuing a PhD in the same fields. Now, along the way, I learned a lot about our immune systems and the microbial organisms that make us sick, how these work together, and sometimes how they do the opposite. But besides the core coursework, I also took classes in genetics, virology, cancer cell biology, and even vaccines themselves. So today, I'm going to be drawing on this background as well as the research and expertise of other scientists in these fields to talk about mRNA and how it's being used in these vaccines to generate protection against this virus. Now, as we'll see, a lot of this new technology is actually rooted in a lot of old school biology. So, let's start by going back to basics. Alright, we've probably all heard about DNA. This is the genetic code, the instructions that make you, you. But today, let's think about DNA as a cookbook. This cookbook has all of the instructions for you to make every single one of your favorite regular meals. It's organized and marked up just the way you like it so that you can find everything you need as quickly and efficiently as you need it. However, this is your most prized possession. And if you are anything like me in the kitchen, things get chaotic and messy very quickly. And you don't want to damage any of these recipes. So your cookbook stays tucked away safely in your kitchen cabinet. Now, when you want to make one of these dishes out of your recipe book, you might take a piece of paper and a pen and copy down the ingredients and the instructions that you need to make that recipe. And this post-it note is what is going to endure all of the kitchen chaos on your counters. Our cells have a way of making their own post-it notes. They make a message from a specific part of the DNA which is going to leave the safety of the nucleus, like the cell's cabinet, called RNA. Much like our post-it note is going to tell us which ingredients to use and how to assemble them to make our casserole or our cake, this RNA is going to instruct our cells of which building blocks they need to use and how to assemble that chain of building blocks into a protein. Proteins are the tools and sometimes the parts and scaffolding of our cells. Now, once we've made our tasty treat, we don't want to clutter up our kitchen counter any more than is necessary. So we'll get rid of our post-it note. Our cells do this as well, disposing of the RNA once the protein has been made. 
In the example of these mRNA vaccines, they're actually only giving one small piece of RNA from the virus to our cells. However, our cells just see RNA and they go ahead and follow the instructions to make the protein. This might be similar to if your friend were to give you one of their recipes that is for a specific part of a cake that may have several parts of filling, the cake itself, and an icing. But you go ahead and you try this recipe that might be for the filling. However, once you make the filling and put it into the rest of the cake and you give it a try, you realize that the filling is actually pretty terrible. So you get rid of that cake and you make a mental note to yourself that you don't like your friend's baking. And so maybe if they were to give you another baked dish or you were to bring a potluck or something, you would remember this experience and you would steer clear of any of their baked goods. In the case of this RNA that gets turned into a protein by our cells, it's going to be stuck out onto the surface of our cells like how it would be on the virus. However, this is still a protein that our cells, specifically our immune cells, aren't used to seeing because it's from a virus. And you see, our immune cells are specially trained to recognize any proteins or other molecules that aren't from our bodies. So they recognize this spike protein as a potential threat and they initiate an immune response against it. This leads to the production of antibodies as well as other cells that will be able to recognize this specific spike protein if they encounter it again. So if the virus were to enter our bodies when we are potentially exposed to it, our immune system will already have been trained to recognize specifically these spike proteins on its surface and will respond to this viral threat rapidly as opposed to having to learn how to mount its response in the first place. However, much like our post-it notes or our baked goods themselves, neither the RNA message nor the protein that our cells make are going to stick around for long. Both the RNA and the protein that is made from it are only going to be around long enough to get the job done, whether that's to deliver a message or to train our immune systems for what to be on the lookout for. Now, you might have noticed that at no point in time did we talk about RNA going into the nucleus to get access to the DNA. That's because biology just doesn't work that way. RNA comes out of the nucleus after the message is copied from the DNA. It doesn't go backwards. Much like how I would never put this post-it note into this nicely bound cookbook, RNA and DNA are two different molecules that you can't force together. Furthermore, much like how our cookbook stays protected in its cabinet, our DNA stays protected in the nucleus, and this RNA can't cross that barrier. So while mRNA as a platform for vaccines is new to us as a concept, it's rooted in some pretty basic old school biology. We're really relying on our cells' ability to do their own baking instead of giving them the final product like a protein in many current vaccines. New things always come with some level of uncertainty, but I hope that this has helped to answer and clear up some of the questions and confusion you may have had about how this platform is going to work, and if you still have any, feel free to check out the sources pinned here, or check out the other sources and experts that will be pinned in the description below. Thanks for watching.